Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for attending this talk. Um, my name is Sharon Talugda, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company you may have heard of called GeoTourist. Um, and GeoTourist has been described as the YouTube of audio guides, um, and we're building an audio map of the world. Sorry. Essentially, we, uh, we, we're trying to answer the question, what makes travel by transforming stories into data that in turn drive footfall. I was originally asked to do this talk back in 2019 by Museum and Heritage. Um, and the theme back then was along the lines of um, turning the museums inside out or museums without walls. And it was based on our experience of extending the visitor experience beyond the threshold of the venue to either outdoors and bringing people to your doorstep or even from the visitors' homes. The, perp sorry, the world has changed a bit since then, and little did we know that only a few months later, the world would change and our platform would become more important, more significant and more relevant to people trying to connect with visitors in their homes when people couldn't travel. The next two, two years was a very um, a big challenge for us, but during that time, we connected with a lot of partners, and um, we're, I'm excited today to uh, launch GeoTourist version two, the pilot of which was re uh, recently won a World Responsible Tourism Award at World Travel Market, and has been cited by a number of respected institutions um, and industry reports, including the coveted Tech Nation Report 2021. Um, Another change in our user engagement was we became more local and hyper-local and community focused. And the second part of today's talk will be um, with one of our National Trust projects, the Roundhouse Birmingham. And it, that embodies everything that we believe in, in terms of local authentic storytelling and venues that go beyond the walls of their venue. Uh, I'm delighted to be sharing the stage with Chris Mayer, who is the uh, creative producer of Roundhouse Birmingham. He is also the, excuse me, I'll get this right, I'll read this one out. He's the project manager at Flatpak's Festival Wonderland project. And as heritage producer based in the Roundhouse, he has worked with their in-house team with a range of partners to produce heritage interpretation, deliver community involvement projects, deliver creative partnerships, and commissions new artwork and builds a volunteer-led, volunteer visitor offer that uses the Grade 2 listed building at the, as the starting point of tours, trails, and various local experiences. So if we start. So our vision is to preserve every location story in place and make it accessible for people forever. And our mission is to accelerate your growth your, and local, the growth of local economies using user engagement and smart data attribution. Our, our platform connects and supports three key stakeholder groups. The visitor, the content creators, and organizations like heritage and attractions and museums. And for the visitors, we provide a free, seamless, immersive technology that connects them to the world around them for the content creators, we provide a versatile platform that, where they can create content, create their stories, and share them with people around the world in various languages, um, and also create multiple uh, monetizing opportunities. And for heritage attractions, associations, various organizations, we help drive their growth by increasing their ROI on their investments in technology, in marketing, and in management. Here is a slide that shows an example of the type of data analytics that we provide organizations who are looking to measure the performance of their attraction venue. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll have, oh, um, and our analytics platform that we're going to be launching today um, has 244 data points out of the box, which might sound daunting, but it's all tailored around your own visitors and it's all generated by your visitors. Uh, 150 of those data points are unique, including one that even Instagram can't get, which is views to visit. So we measure the attribution of the content that brings your visitors into your venues. 
the solution is already created. You don't have to spend months and expense building something. And the ROI can be up to 40 times. And over to Mr. Video Man, please. So this is the um, launch of GeoToys version 2. And it's going to go through the user experience and then show you what's the underlying part in the background with the data analytics. So at the, at the very heart, it's a very simple audio tour platform, which people can scroll through and look for content, whether it's near or far. Um, people can create their own content. So we have locals all the way through up to respected institutions. And then the user experience is very simple. Stories on the map, you guide yourself around, which we're going to see very shortly. But everything's customizable. Categories can be as many as you want. We use tags to help people find content. And this is the user experience. So it starts with simple mapping, and we're evolving into augmented reality, very simple augmented reality, which shows you where the content is around you. And we measure what points drive footfall. And all of that, you, you, can, you can check uh, what's there before you go and listen to content before you go. And here is the analytics dashboard, which will show you the kind of engagement you're getting and what's driving footfall. All of the data can be delivered in real time as well. So you can measure times of day when you get more footfall, what days are better, where are your people coming from, and also consumer modeling data, which um, shows what types of content your visitors are engaging before they arrive and actually when they arrive in your venue and attraction. Tours are made up of points, so you can see you can go down to the granular level to see which points are driving football. And we also have an ability for you to whitelist your influencers to see which of those are actually driving footfall for real to your destination. So that's the end of the video, I think. You'll get another chance to scan the QR code in a sec. So essentially, we want to accelerate growth in these areas, cultural attractions and events. The ROI, as I said, you save on building your own technology. The marketing um, platform will allow you to spend directly on the things that are bringing your visitors in. And our real-time maps, as you saw, will show you where are your bottlenecks, where are people engaging with, and they help you, um, help you with eyes on the ground without having to man those resources your, yourself. Um, this is a um, uh, thing that a lot of you will have seen from Visit Britain, which shows the typical ROI of every pound spent on the visitor economy, which is 21 pounds back, but we aim to double that. Here's your QR code if anyone's interested. And with that, I'll hand over to Chris. Thank you very much. Oh, here's some of our partners. There you go. Cheers. Thanks, Sean. Right. Uh, it's really nice to be here speaking at the, uh, the show and I um, want to say, uh, say thank you to Sharon and Geo Tories for inviting me to speak at the slot. Um, I think this is basically a little bit of a case study in how the, the Geo Tories platform can be applied. Um, so that's the reason why they, they brought us in. And there is a lot of kind of creative production stuff in here as well as the data, but hopefully it will kind of give you a bit of a window into how this can be used. Um, bit of the egocentric bit at the moment. Uh, we've already done a bio, so <laughs> we'll skip that part. But this is the kind of things that I do. My name's Chris. Um, and yeah, you can find me there. So uh, Roundhouse Birmingham uh, is an independent charity that I work for. Um, is anyone aware of Roundhouse Birmingham or the Roundhouse? Give us a quick show of hands. There's a few. Let's do the opposite, just for kind of scale. Never heard of us before? Never visited? There we go. OK. I know where we are. So uh, the Roundhouse is in Birmingham. Funnily enough, from the title, um, we uh, are based on the Birmingham Mainline Canal, um, and we're a Grade Two star listed building um, that's situated next to water, next to road, and right next to Birmingham City Centre. Historically, uh, the building was a public works department building for the Birmingham Corporation, so an early form of the council in the area. Um, and you can see from those drawings how it's kind of at this nice intersection between all of these different bits of road and rail. And, uh, and canals, um, and in its function as a, a working depot, 
that kind of strategic placement was really useful for bringing things in and out of the, uh, of, of the depot to do things like this. So lots of down-to-earth tasks within our depot at Sheepcut Street, um, lamp lighting, uh, paving roads, uh, horses that were stable there would be carting things to and from. Um, and yeah, basically a Victorian hub for the essential workers of the day. I think that's what we'd probably call them nowadays um, after recent years. That location and that kind of history is kind of relevant to the way we're going with our program and I'll talk about that in a second. More recently, the building had a bit of a um, sort of stop-start history. It was Grade 2 star listed in 1976, um, which you know, was a key factor in its survival, um, but it kept going as a working depot and then had a few things where it was going to be horse and cart stabling, uh, police stables, all these sorts of things. Uh, no ideas really stuck. It was even um, a, a place for a, a local music venue next door, um, which kind of came and went. So it's kind of a curious little survivor, really, on the edge of uh, Birmingham's city centre and on next to its sort of famous canal network. 2013, our project really began uh, before I joined the project. I've been there since 2017 um, after the funding was secured, so I got to spend it rather than raise it. Um, and the, uh, the partnership that to revive the building was uh, a partnership for the first time between the Canal and River Trust and the National Trust. And that uh, resulted in a new charity being set up called Roundhouse Birmingham with a brand new aspiration for the building. Um, and our major funders for the National Lottery Heritage Fund and Historic England who supported the Capital Works program. There it is, undergoing a bit of a facelift. It was in a bit of disrepair and a need, much needed TLC. Uh, we opened the doors uh, in shoo, July last year, 2021. I'm losing track of the years. I'm sure you'll all be where I am with that. Um, we've completely renovated the building, given it a new purpose. The idea is to have a Vista Centre, have a programme of activities that talk about the heritage of the city, which again, I'll get to with Joe Tourist, and, um, but also to kind of reinvent it and to make it sustainable. So the idea um, from this complex project was to mix heritage enterprise, large sections of the site ready for tenancies, um, whilst being a new uh, charity, whilst being outward facing uh, to tourism, um, we had community co-creation of our projects right at the centre of everything. Um, there were a few delays to building works um, due to, you know, the fun of working with old and slightly um, cantankerous buildings, I think. You might have some experience with that. Um, we then had a post-COVID visitor hesitancy, but we were fairly well positioned based on the, uh, the nature of our program. And um, you'll see what I mean by that in a second, because it's an inside out concept. So it's not so much about the visit and, the, and a museum site. It's a repurposed building that then launches people out into the city. So um, we're an independent charity. Um, we secure the, the future of the Grade 2 star listed roundhouse um, through letable space. But then the second one, which is more relevant to what we're talking about today, which is our launch pad for tours and events, um, our program that invites Bir uh, people to see Birmingham from a new perspective. The cheesy hashtag, see the city differently. So these are bits and bobs of corporate jargon that I'm going to breeze through nice and quickly. So here's our um, heritage programming approach. At the center of it all right there, that's what we hope a roundhouse experience will look like. Um, something that's creative, something that gets people out and moving, and something that joins the dots of Birmingham city center, whether it's heritage assets or local features, um, arts trails, that sorts of stuff. We do active stuff like walking, cycling, digital trails, again, most relevant for today, um, and stand up paddle boarding. Lots of these launching for the first time this summer. There's always a creative element where we can get that in. So we gamify some of the tours with top trump cards or bingo cards, where we can, where we can make it work. We're still working some of those things out. Um, we've had uh, home collage projects. Um, we try to be as uh, bold as we can with our displays and creative. And we've done a couple of publications with, uh, with young people in the area as well. Connective, so we like to link up with things. So the B16 area is where we're situated. We joined up with Light Up B16, we, uh, which illuminated windows and created an arts trail out of that. So again, getting people moving whilst sort of overlapping with a bit of a creative endeavor. Um, and all of these different partners that we've worked with. Uh, Edgebaston Reservoir is key to one of the bits that we'll be talking about uh, in a second. So this is the main guided tour program. We kayak, we take people around our site, we take people around local uh, features in the city, Centenary Square there on the right hand side in the center. Um, heritage boat trips and then nighttime paddles and kayaks too. 
Um, it's been really fun to get people out and moving in Birmingham. And that's what I mean by something that's well positioned for, um, for the kind of post-COVID world initially at least. You're outdoors, you're able to social distance, gave people a little bit of an in. Um, to be honest, it didn't always result in um, people coming to things because people were still hesitant for even that. People got out of the habit of things and I'm probably preaching to the converted in terms of that uh, with this audience. Okay, so um, one of our bits of work is uh, we call community routes. We work with the community to create new routes and tours around the city and we thought the GeoTourist platform was a really, really um, perfect platform for the way that we wanted to do something. So we've got those regular guided tours, they're paid admission. We had a little bit of a concern that there wasn't a full accessibility to that program because we wanted to offer some free activities. Um, we wanted to offer some free trails, pay as you feel maybe, but um, at least, you know, off the bat on a platform that a lot of people could access um, and uh, could enable them to get out and experience the way that we wanted to do our program if they can't afford at all. Ugh. That's the contents of my head um, while we were in the project. Don't read it all. Um, that's what happens with creative producers when they're stuck in the house during lockdown. Um, so these are all the partners at the top. These are all the things we did to survey people and work with them on, on a range of audio tours. And then, um, yeah, those are the, 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 the products, experiences that we decided to, um, to encompass with this project after all of that consultation. You'll notice in the middle, there's a GeoTourist uh, platform. So five audio tours that are hosted on the platform now, all recorded and produced with different people. Um, an arts commission which shadowed the creation of all those tours on the left with Claire Cotterill who created a range of collage artworks and a range of designers that created paper trails as well for people who thought that the, the platform might be not quite for them because there is some digital hesitancy in some of the audiences that we have. So this is the audio tour range. Um, little known Ladywood, kind of obvious really, but Ladywood is our area. These are the little known elements of the history of the area which we worked up with the local history group. Revealing the reservoir, which I'll focus on in a second, um, we worked on with the local friends of. Um, we've got a photography trail which inflects a photography walk around Birmingham city centre with some little known history and heritage. Uh, a duck's eye view tour, that's for boaters and paddlers who want to do the heritage tour, so um, kind of again, sort of fairly straightforward as to what that is. Um, and a sensory walk, so one where we played around with the format a little bit, got a little bit more experimental with it and encouraged people to kind of listen, stop, notice, reflect, as well as again getting a little bit of the heritage. So in particular, uh, revealing the reservoir is kind of my favorite, although don't tell any of the other participants. Um, the, uh, the, the tour came together, and you can see on the bottom right-hand side of the screen, we created a 13-point tour on the uh, point, yeah, a tour which includes 13 points. Um, so uh, they all focused on different elements that we worked on with the Friends of group. So there were things like uh, the, a more straightforward historical introduction when you arrived, which is based on that GPS point, so you walk in and it triggers. Then things that were more focused on the active life of the reservoir. So the reservoir itself has got lots of different users and stakeholders, and some of those are runners and joggers and um, paddlers, rowers. Um, and then we went through lots of different stages where we were like, here's a, a moment to have a bit of a sensory reflection. Um, here's a stop around the community and what they particularly felt and valued about that space. And then we went through to um, a, a final stop on the tour, which is around uh, a heritage building uh, which is uh, very much at risk at the moment, called the Tower Ballroom, which I'll mention in a second. Um, but essentially, we, yeah, we, we went through a lot of co-scripting, lots of Zoom sessions, um, lots and lots of, um, of consultation, lots and lots of uh, follow-up research when we had ideas. And yeah, it was a, a, it produced a fantastic tour, uh, which then we brought in and we got people to narrate, lots of first-time narrators, lots of coaching required. Um, but resulted in something that was quite special because people got to take a bit of ownership over that tour. And you'll notice that it's not even at the Roundhouse. It's joined up to a local asset which people have a lot of fondness and connection to and has a load of brilliant stories connected to it. So again, jumping off our site to get to a local asset and explain it and interpret it. So um, I'm going to play a little bit of audio. I think we've got time still. Yeah, I'm running ahead for once. Um, so keep that picture, the Terra Ballroom um, dates back to uh, the 1870s when it started off as a Victorian roller skating rink. I didn't know they were into roller skating, but apparently they were. Um, Rinkomania, they called it. Um, then it went through various different guises as a boxing venue, a venue, a club, loads of music, New Order, the Smiths. Huge 
huge, rich uh, and varied um, uh, history. Uh, but as you can see, not in the best of states at the moment, and it's actually scheduled for demolition. Um, it's a very kind of special place, which a lot of the local people have demonstrated about, and they've used this tour as a bit of a tool in explaining some of that, which has been really nice. Um, send your letters to Birmingham City Council. I didn't say that. Um, so, um, yeah, so this is Birmingham's Child, which is written in response to the identity of the Tale Ballroom, which we um, wanted to include in the tour, because we felt that actually, as well as the history, as well as the sensory stuff, as well as the kind of walking around, you want some creative interpretation in there as well. So um, I'm going to play the WAV, hopefully it'll play, by Simone Woodsmith. Keep, keep that in your mind. It was a water birth of sorts. Edge Baston caught me with itching fingers laced in promises. Birmingham's child. I was taught never to fit into the boxes they made for us. Learned how to walk through thick waters, how to grip my toes on the dirt through the powerful blows of wind. I was born not to look pretty but to break rules. I began as a place where skates would cut through my ice, a cold place that somehow warmed frozen dreams. Dust the cobwebs off my boxing ring to fill the blows, hear the bells to see the first time winds, the broken smiles of the underdogs, worn out gloves, spilt drinks, sticky floors. The margins of my rooms hold more than music. They hold love stories, flowers, photographers, vowels locked tight inside me. For years I've swung hips, tapped feet with them. Yet still, they flock to me, small in their numbers, yet mighty in their sway, their dance, their skate. Though I am short in stature, they call me tower. Maybe that's because they stand on my shoulders to reach themselves. Edge Baston, a place never limited by doors closed or abandoned buildings. So you can't keep my doors shut. I will bleed out into the car parts. They will spray paint my face in color, skateboard on my wall, street dance on my concrete, sing melodies that echo beneath the arch of my doors. They will skate through blisters, dance in the rain. You can't stop us from dancing. You can't stop us from singing. You can't stop me from breathing. My rhythm is in the water that surrounds us. My history is woven into these bricks. I was born not to look pretty, but to break rules. I am Birmingham's child who learned how to walk through thick waters, how to grip my toes on the dirt through the powerful blows of wind. Your wind will not take me down. I am Birmingham's child. So that uh, poem written in response to the identity and history of that place. Um, I'd urge you to write down Simone Wordsmith and maybe check her work out. Um, go on. Can't see you doing it. Um, <laughs> Okay, so it's an example of how um, you can uh, use the format to do lots of different things. You can change the tone, you can change uh, the speed, you can change the type of content, you can make people feel things, which is weird, particularly when they're right in front of um, a building like that. Okay, Ugh, look at all that text. So um, this is mainly for my benefit, because <laughs> keep me on track. So. From the creative process, we perhaps focus too heavily. Uh, so this is maybe some learning if you were going to take on the GeoTourist platform and going to, to work on something yourself. Um, we looked at the co-creation side, funnily enough, that's where my leaning is. Um, perhaps a little bit unprepared for the full range of these tours going live in terms of what they look like and when they were kind of 
going concerns and how you promote them and you know, how you learn from the data, which I'll come to in a second. Um, the co-production element led to loads of twists and turns, funnily enough, um, but it is a better process in the long run, so build that time in. Um, the, uh, we think about n uh, the, the naming of something, which is, um, which is really important. Um, you think about a really creative name and people don't know what it is. <laughs> think about a really straightforward name and you know, oh, creative producer, it should be more exciting than that. But you know, people know what it is, funnily enough, and the ones where you make it quite straightforward tend to get the most clicks. Um, the format's really flexible, uh, as I said, with uh, something like Simone's piece, you can play around with it. Um, think about the complementary non-digital assets. Well, that's my robotic text at best, so um, do some paper stuff along with it, um, because people do want those sometimes, although I'm sorry, Sean, that's, um, yeah, yeah, people do want the paper stuff sometimes. Um, you're braining the ambition a little bit. So we did five, Ooh, it was quite a lot to promote and to do. Um, it is very involved and you really actually, you want to dig into some production stuff, which is you know, quite creative. And sometimes if you spread yourself a little bit too thin, that production is um, harder to do. Learning from the data. So we're only really scratching the surface at the moment in terms of, it's been live for just under a year. Um, the data and analytics that Sean has, has kind of explained and shown and demonstrated are always being added to as well. So there's loads and loads of combinations, almost infinite now, that you could go and have a look to see where, what people are doing in terms of when they listen, when they stop, where they pick it up, do they start on different days, where are they from, all sorts of things. So uh, we're only scratching the surface on there. On a basic level, um, having a range of tools gives us data on a comparative demand per type of experience. So we're doing some kind of user testing alongside it as well. So we've got a photography walk versus a canal walk versus a, um, a little known uh, history walk. Um, that's helping us to kind of look at demand for our products in the future in a slightly less labor intensive way than if we were continually running guided tours of those versions. Um, so a lot of investment at the beginning, but something that you can uh, pick up from later on. Um, Practical decisions over footfall versus off-site locations. So we, when we do this sort of thing in future, we'll be making a decision about whether we're drink, drawing people to us or whether we're going out to the city. And um, linked to that, um, where footfall's the driver, um, we, we, we tend to put the, um, the location of our venue very early on because we are finding that people tend to, um, to, to, to listen more intently and then they naturally drop off. So you want to get your visit in and you're driving your footfall for a particular reason early on in the tour. Then the last one, um, which is always the tricky one because everyone's always kind of, you know, working fingers to the bone in lots of different areas. But how does it link into what you're doing? How can you use it as an analytical tool to really examine your footfall? How can you link it into your commercial offer? How can you link it into different tours that you're doing so you can create packages, all sorts of things? Don't look at it as a self-contained thing, which we perhaps did as a co-production thing for our project. And next tour is with um, an organization called We Don't Settle. And uh, we're doing one at a time this time rather than five. There's some learning. Um, and that's a Black Heritage audio tour of the local area, which is worked on by five young activators. You can see them there on the right, um, who are producing that with us. So they are um, going out and talking to people in shops, in restaurants, um, some famous people from Birmingham, hopefully, linking it to black owned businesses, linking it to black culture in the area um, and interviewing people essentially I'm going to be turning that into an audio tour that will hopefully be live in time for Birmingham Heritage Week in the summer. Right. So you can find the tours, let's plug, on GeoTourist, so search Roundhouse Birmingham and our range will pop up. Um, if you happen to be in the area then they'll be uh, geolocated so you'll pop up there too and you can find Roundhouse Birmingham on all of those places. Um, thank you very much for listening, um, I think we're going to open up for some questions, is that right? Thank you. Thank, thank you both so much. Really fascinating. So any questions, I'll come to you with the mic so that we make sure everyone can hear. Yeah. Hi there. Um, I, I just wanted to get an idea from you uh, with the audio tours about how people, what you might call onboarding, where are they discovering these tours and then converting and then taking part in them? Is that in a front of house setting? Is it leaflets? Yeah, are you promoting it with uh, physical people uh, using websites? Do you have any sort of data about where you go from, from when information is provisioned to when people are actually activating and doing the tour? Is there any information there? Do they, yeah. 
cop-out answer and say we're learning all the time. Um, so um, at the beginning, we, uh, we've got them all listed on our website, basically all of the things that you said. At the start of it, because it was rooted in a co-production project which had an exhibition involved with it, we had a call to action within the exhibition that said, here is all of the stuff that's gone on to create these tours. Here are their paper counterparts. Here are the QR codes. Here's some descriptions. And that, that's kind of like, you land in the exhibition, now go off and explore. So that worked to an extent. Um, and then we've also got some more sort of traditional things like it's listed as an ongoing event on our website, which is drawing people to it. And then like you say, within the front of house setting, when we don't have any tours on, that's the first thing that people are upselling. And now we have some paper assets as well, which are being sort of distributed out to tourist information centers as well. So we're trying to do as many things as possible. Now what we need to do, like you said, is right, where's Vista Journey? How's it landing? And then obviously within the app itself. Am I, am I on? Yes, hi. Um, so the beauty of every tour and every point on GeoTour is, is everything is kind of hyperlinked. So you can embed your tour in a social media post. You can, as Chris mentioned, you can do it as a QR code. And every, every place where you position that tour, online or offline, that's the entry point. And that can be measured all the way through to when somebody actually comes to your, to, comes to your venue or attraction. So that whole view to visit attribution thing starts there. So it could be anywhere in the world. So the person could be viewing a roundhouse tour in India and maybe two years down the line, they pop up in the venue. That's a view to visit conversion. And there's nothing else in the world that does that right now. And because our platform's open free, you know, there's no barrier to entry for a visitor to actually find your content in the first place. And it's up to you where you want to kind of uh, position that. Great, thank you. Any more questions? Come, yes, hi. Cool, okay. Thank you for a really great talk. Um, my question's also maybe about like, more about the afterlife of the content that gets made. So either for the platform itself or for the, from the project perspective, um, what, happens, what happens next maybe when the content is either decommissioned or maybe when the platform gets upgraded? Will there be like an archival functionality or maybe will it get passed on to say the Birmingham Museum as part of their digital archives? Like I'm just really interested and in, because so often these things are really cool but certainly for me as a bit of a culture nerd I often get the thing where I kind of go maybe a few years too late. It's like oh that'd be really cool to listen to but it's, it's off now so yeah. Absolutely. I mean that, to answer your question, that was our number, number two slide. We want to preserve stories in location forever because we understand the value that they have for the place and wider. So our intention is to keep all the stories as long as the, the storytellers want to keep them there and leave them there in place so that you can continue to measure what's engaging people years after you've published it. Yeah, we, um, sorry, um, we have for the new project, because of the ability to get out and talk to people a little bit more regularly, um, the, the kind of input into the project is involving a lot more oral, his, oral history and interviewing and, and chatting with people and recording that. So hopefully we'll have a really nice archive that sits along what we do edit out to kind of create each stop. So we'll be editing things down to a point, but then we'll have these longer interviews. So yeah, and then we'd hope, we, we're hoping to archive those within Birmingham Library, hopefully. Thank you. Great question. Any, any other questions? Coming? No? No, well, do feel free to come and chat to these two um, yeah. afterwards as well, um, if you want to ask them directly. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, thank you very much. Good thank round you. of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Um, just to let you know that at 12.15, um, it is 12, no, 1.15, the day is flying. At 1.15, our next talk, we've got uh, Richard, who, Richard Moss, who's the editor of Museum Crush. So it's more storytelling about collections. Uh, Richard's running a session on digital storytelling for small museums. And we've got Liz from Royal Crown Derby Museum and Charlotte from Gawthorpe Textiles Collection. And they are gonna come and talk about that. So do come back and see us at 1.15 if you can. Thanks everyone.